So Tim Sheets, VP of Marketing here at, at uh, Falcon Store. So we understand there's a lot of changes that are going on that we need to start looking at how we do them different, that some of those traditional approaches you know, aren't gonna solve the problems as we move forward, right? It may solve pieces of the problems, but it's not, not gonna solve the, or address the entire equation. There's a lot of terms floating around the industry of what software-defined storage mean. And at Falcon Store, we take a very purist view. We believe that you should be able to move, protect, migrate, store, recover, optimize your data on or off the cloud, regardless of any hardware, network, or protocol. If you have to rely on the capability of the underlying physical infrastructure to execute something, you are not software-defined. Right? If you don't have the ability to take different paradigms of storage, different flavors, different brands, aggregate that, right? abstract the capabilities from the underlying hardware and deploy it, right? you're not truly software defined. You know, if you think about it, there are competitive products out there that say they're software defined, but they rely on the capabilities of the underlying hardware to execute things like replications or snapshots. If you want to go change that hardware out, how do you move all that data over and maintain the context? Because if you're relying on a specific controller or piece of hardware to take the snapshot and all the context of the data around it, and you change vendors, the vendor's going to treat it differently. So how do you move that over? You get locked in. Our goal is to give you, the, the customers, organizations, the ability to have the freedom and flexibility to choose the right hardware based on application, needs, requirements, business needs, requirements, performance needs, requirements, budgetary requirements, right? Let's give control back to these guys, not maintain and lock them in or even lock them out. And that's really the whole concept of where we started with our platform and actually why we call it FreeStore. What we've done is, you know, you guys understand the virtualization space very, very well. That's why you're here. That's why you guys are delegates. You know, on the front end, virtualizing, you know, applications and servers is certainly not new. But there's a point of view and a paradigm, right, where you're trying to maintain control plane at that layer. You don't always control all the, contr the storage resources. You can consume the storage resources, but you don't always control the storage resources or the data services and capability of those resources. Certainly there's things like vCenter plugins and vVol and Vasa and VAI, or you know, there's things that you can do with, with KVM and there's things that you can do, you know, obviously OpenStack, but there's a limit of the control that's there. Virtualizing <coughs> storage is not new. We've been doing that as a company since 2007. Right? But the challenge that we have is typically when you virtualize, it's within your own stack or that own set of hardware and those platforms. You know, no dis disrespect to our, our, our friends over at HP, but think about them. Right? They've got three different ways to virtualize now. More is coming. Right? You've got three part. That virtualizes one way. You've got VSA. You've got store once. But those are all different platforms with different ways to virtualize and therefore different contexts and different controls. Do you have one way to go manage across all of those platforms today? Now, I'm sure HP is working on that, and I'm not picking on them. It's just an example of we see virtualization, but it tends to be in a vertical approach, platform by platform. What we're doing with FreeStore is we are disaggregating from that. We are abstracting that. We're creating that intelligent abstraction layer, and we are taking a data services first approach. Guys, this is a true data services middleware approach, okay? We don't care what's above it. I don't care what's behind it. I can come in, I can consume the resources, be able to provision, apply the appropriate resources and orchestrate that out to whatever the OS of the application is. It doesn't matter what's below, it doesn't matter what's in front. And that's really an approach that we feel is gonna give that flexibility and the freedom. <coughs> You know, we, you know, there's been that huge rush for all flash arrays today. People are putting those in. Question, question yes. There. So you're saying then basically, yeah, I've got a HCL, a hardware compatibility list. Yours will run with anything and work on any storage. I, you know, you can never say you're 100% support everything, right? It's, it's, it, one, it's not possible. Two, it's just too damned expensive. But I will say, we've been doing this for 15 years. I'll argue that we probably have the largest, if not one of the top, one or two largest compatibility lists when it comes to storage and network switches on the planet. Compare us to IBM, right, with SVC. Uh, our compatibility list is oh, at least 4x of what theirs is. You know, look at who, you know, any other software vendor out there. We're going to support all the tier ones, majority of the tier twos, and a good part of the tier threes. 
more importantly, if you have something that's not on our list, it's pretty easy to, for us to go do a field test to make sure it's going to work. If it does, great. If it doesn't, we'll figure out if that makes sense to do some more testing and figure out how to make it compatible for you. Is that because your software is better at handling QDEPs and all those kind of things? That's right. That hardware related? Or? We've done a, we've got a ton, again, we've got 15 years experience working with a lot of different platforms to figure out, hey, how do you optimize? How do you tune? You know, you think about these guys that want to put in new flash arrays into an existing environment. A lot of times those vendors will tell you, great, if you want to run Oracle on us, you've got to do a greenfield implementation. What if I, because I'm abstracted, I could say, you know what? I can move that entire workload from a legacy platform to your new platform. You don't have to start greenfield. I can do it in a planned, orchestrated way, minimize or eliminate the downtime or disruption altogether, and eliminate all of your risk. So would that be interesting? Or do you want to have to say, hey, you know what? Mm. I've got this you know, Oracle rack that I've been running for two and a half years. I've got to abandon it, start completely fresh with a brand new implementation over here because I want to get on a high performance storage. So just the kind of things that you sit in front of, obviously uh, <coughs> um, bare metal, but are you talking about storage and managing? Is it HP, EMC, NetApp, those kind of things? That's that right. You create this virtualized storage layer in front of... And I'm going to show you an example of that. So you're a great straight man, and I think it's my <coughs> next uh, slide or two. I'm going to give you an example exactly how we do that. So as moving forward throughout the presentation, one of the things I would like to see is how is FreeStore different than what you guys have done in the past? So IP Store. Oh, yeah, you got an it. awful lot like IP Store. Yep. I will absolutely make sure and touch on those points for you. I think it's going to be pretty clear for you. Okay. Starting with this slide. So... What we have done is we've taken a lot of our capabilities that we've had over the past 15 years. Instead of having point products, we've merged them together in a completely new platform called FreeStore. We've taken, we've completely modernized the IP Store Core engine. Uh, we'll talk about some more detail on that, right? But this is not the IP Store Core engine of old. It is a brand new, fully functioning engine. And then we've integrated a lot of those 15 years worth of data services that are already proven. And now it's one platform, one view, one price. It gives me the ability to not sell you point products with point licenses. I can sell you one product, capacity-based, all the features are included, no, no surprises. You don't have to pay feature by feature anymore. And what we've done, right, is we focused on, these are really the four core use cases that you actually, a lot of you guys know us for, you know, where, you know, being able to migrate. How do you get off a legacy platform to a new platform or move from one location to another location? We can do that in a policy-based orchestrated way. It's WAN optimized, right? How do you now, something that is new from us, right? Having clusters is <coughs> not new, but we are active-passive. Now we are true active-active synchronous clustering, continuously available. And so we've now integrated that into FreeStore. You certainly know us for our CDP product for being able to do snapshots, you know, right? We were one of the first to be, you know, uh, application aware and software defined snapshots that you kind of see that's a bit of a, a table stakes now in the, in the industry. But we also have in integrated RecoverTrack, right? That is the most automated policy based recovery engine on the planet. I can take you and recover you from physical to different physical. I can convert you from physical to virtual on the fly. I can even convert you from virtual to virtual. I don't know of any other vendor that does that on the planet today. I'm not just saying, hey, I can recover your bits. We can look at things, for example, say you have a web farm. You certainly have your Apache servers running Linux up front. Right behind that is your content and a database you know, somewhere feeding that content. I can look at all of that move it over, when I move it over, validate that all the drivers, all the pieces, all the elements, the network connections are all in place, and I can restart those services. So I'm moving the entire workloads, not just the bits. Again, something that uniquely differentiates us from anybody else out there. You no longer have to have separate tools for your physical world or your virtual world. You can use a common set of tools now across all of those environments. Questions? So, just to be clear, what you're saying is, I can take you from a VMS file system Okay, I can take, then take you into a Hyper-V environment mm -hmm. on the fly, zero downtime. You strip out the VM tools and everything else inside of that particular virtual machine or not. So I could literally take you from a Hyper-V environment and convert you to a VMware environment if you wanted or vice versa. With zero downtime, live migration. Okay, so you're never going to get complete conversion and recovery with zero downtime, right? That is not I possible. Think too much, Craig. I know, I, just, but what I can do... I want to just understand what, what it does. But what, what, I, but I, what I can do, right? So I can help you dramatically reduce 
your recovery time, right? You can, we can get really granular on recovery point, but let's talk recovery time objective. Because our snapshots are mountable and bo instantaneously bootable, my recovery time is now, what's the reboot time on a VM? So if I want to take you from a physical environment, convert you to a physical, I mean, from a physical environment, and convert you to a virtual, I load that as a VM, orchestrate the VM, and reboot it. So a benefit is you, you don't have to do any conversion or that kind of thing. The we can do that for you. Disk. Sure. And but, but again, right, this is not new technology. This has been around since two, from us from 2011. So it's, again, we're building on that capability that we've had for a number of years. All right? So what you're going to see is our competitors, we've got lots of competitors in each one of these pillars. Who's got the capability <coughs> on a single platform to do all of these things? That's where we really begin to set ourselves apart. Right? Think about it. NSS. NSS. CDP. Optimized backup and dedupe, right? We've now integrated inline deduplication. We sit in the data path. We can offload the dedupe, but now more importantly, I can give you global dedupe across your entire storage infrastructure, no longer array by array, platform by platform. Again, how we begin to differentiate. So, um, in the interest of time, uh, I'm actually gonna jump ahead here a little bit. Who are we targeting with this? And I'm going to talk about who we target, and then I'm going to talk to you, literally show you how the architecture, how the approach works. There's really, really two core markets, um, three core markets, excuse me. You know, one, um, how do we, you know, getting back to some of our OEM routes, how do we go help some of those hardware provider guys who, you know, maybe have an incomplete stack or immature stack or maybe gaps in their stack, and how do we go work with those guys? We've, we've uh, announced partnerships with a number of folks like, you know, Cam and Ario, XIO, and a few others um, in that space. The other places that we're targeting are, how do you help enterprises modernize their existing infrastructure? How do you get them from where they are today to where they want to go tomorrow? I touched on this a little bit. You got a person who's got, you know, uh, one of the top three name brand storage appliance, storage arrays. And he wants to say, put in now one of the leading flash array guys. Does a legacy vendor give you the tools to migrate off their platform in an orchestrated policy-based manner to the new platform? I don't know of one that offers that capability today. Do the top or even second tier flash array providers have those tools for them to migrate from a legacy to a new. Certainly you can do block copy, right? You can replicate the data in a straight block copy, but are they gonna do that in a policy driven way that you can schedule around performance, maintenance windows, IO thresholds, right? Do they give you all those tools to do that in a non-disruptive way to insert now where I can say, hey, I don't have to deploy that Oracle database on a new implementation. I can actually take my legacy workload and migrate it over in a planned way. So you're saying then you can apply policies to the source array and say, if for example my throughput goes above a certain benchmark, then stop the data migration going across onto my new target storage array? I can throttle you back, okay. let it either come back, send an alert, pause it, we give you the, control, how you, the ability of how you want to control that. Okay. Whether it's manual, whether it's policy and automated, we give you that granularity. Let me, let me just jump in please. Uh, so. This is Farid Yavari. So, so you said those policies on free store, you don't set it on the legacy array. Right. Understood. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Understood. So, I, target customer question. This goes back to your original problem statement. You know, we talked about the four different types of mm -hmm. storage use cases, and you know, one of which was the transactional based stuff. So, right. some of the things that you know, questions that I'm not quite formulated yet has been. The target for your continuous data replication product might have been transactional database, uh, transactional workloads. Are we saying that this solution is targeted to all four of those use cases from a holistic perspective, or just this portion of the capability is targeted towards that first That's transactional? a fantastic question, and thank you for asking that, right? Because if you, you know, if we're going to stand up here and say, hey, I'm all things to all people, I'm actually nothing to anybody, right? You know, you think about it, right? Who takes a Swiss Army knife into battle? <laughs> Nobody. You know, it looks cool. What we do is we address these four fundamental use case areas. 
when we go and we engage our customers, you know, we, help, we try to find out, hey, do you have one or two of these that's your primary problem that we can help you solve? And we help them go solve that. And then what you'll see is, and oh, by the way, because we allow you to turn these services on or off at will with no extra fees, you don't have to stop, get a license, pay extra royalty, right? They can now say, oh, wow, well, you also, you know, maybe I bought you to migrate off and create now a continuous, you know, cluster on an old VNX, EMC VNX that can't be active active, but I can now make it active active. I don't have to go buy new hardware. Oh, now, guess what? I can dedupe that. I don't have to go buy a data domain box of dedupe. I can now use this, just turn on the service and dedupe it. So what we find is we get in solving one for one or two problems, and then they realize over time there's other capabilities built in. They can try them out, and now it's a, it's a land and expand opportunity. So I'm conflicted because I see two different uh, ends of the, this thing. I remember the individual products where CDP might have, uh, or protection might have uh, competed directly with data domain. So these are like literally four different products that you guys had and you sold as four different SKUs. As I, I still have the licenses in my drawer at home. Sure. And they were decent individual pro products. We combined them together into one product called Freestore. But it is a Swiss Army knife. It's, it's, but it, no, it's not. And, and, and let me explain this why. One, there's capabilities we have in Freestore that we don't have in our point products, right? Mm -hmm. There's going to be a number of things that I'm going to walk you through, and I'll explain how it's different. Things like a centralized database is fully REST, fully REST capable, HTML5 interface, right? You can see everything from a single console, um, and we're usually going to demo a console for you. So there's things that we're doing that allow you to now manage holistically across your entire environment that those pro point products never do did and aren't capable of doing. It required a new architecture from us to be able to go put that in place. The point products were great because I could go say, hey, if I need to go dedupe and, and optimize my backup, I could do that in an appliance-based approach, whether you bought the software or an appliance from us, it didn't matter, but I'm gonna go solve for X, mm -hmm. right? But that's still a silo, right? And, and so you need a unique set of tools just like anybody else, data domain or anyone else to go do that. What we're saying is take and strip away that legacy thinking put in a software-defined infrastructure with a common interface, and now I can have the ability to turn things on or off as relevant to what my problems are that I want to solve in my data center. Remember, I am not charging you, and you are not paying for these features, or those features, or the, you're, you're paying for the capacity you use. All the features are included. If you don't need dedupe, great, don't use it. You're not paying for it. You need it, turn it on. There's a beautiful thing that happens, is once you dedupe it, we consider that managed capacity. I'm only going to charge you for the capacity that you're managing behind free store. Our point products didn't work that way. So I, I think you're going to see a little more clarity when I walk through the next architecture slide. So let me jump through the, the, the other two targets, and then I think it will really add a lot of clarity for you. We talked about you know, customers wanting to implement new technology. The other key thing is really the MSPs and the service providers out there. We have found that engaging with MSPs around the world, we've, we've announced you know, at least a, a dozen of them uh, since we launched in May. They look at it for one of two ways. One, they have the, the, the silo and the sprawl problem of managing and proliferating storage silos. You know, too many individual things to manage. They can't get the efficiency they need, right? They're paying license array by array, feature by feature. It's very, very expensive and it gets very complex very quickly. Not to mention the fact that now when they go and get customers and they have to get customer data from the customer premise to their own premise, oftentimes the storage at the customer site is different from what they have in their hosting facilities. Right? So they don't have a common way to move the data, manage it, all in a seamless way. So typically we'll call that the back end. From a front end point of view, they're also looking at it as can they now have a common set of tools that now enables them to offer additional data services that they can begin to then monetize as a service. So they can now offer things like migration as a service in a planned way, right? measured way. They can do replication, they can do continuity, they can do protection and recovery. So now they're also looking at new revenue streams or enhancing some of the revenue streams they already have in a more cost-effective, higher margin way. So again, this is a value-added play where, let's say migration, let's take migration as a use case. Mm -hmm. Before I would go out and either buy your migration product or go look at like a Novell solution and 
if I'm an MSP, I come in and say, hey, you know what, I'll migrate 800 workloads and that was based on, that licensing for those products were based on the number of workloads you're, you're migrating. Now you're coming and saying, you know, this is a platform and migration is just a function that the platform Provides. It's a function. You're going to pay for capacity, right? And if there's temporary capacity, I'm not going to hold you to that. I'm going to look at your aggregate capacity over time, giving you the flexibility to go, hey, turn it on, turn it off as you need it. I'm not going to charge you uniquely just for that migration. Again, it's helping that service provider now have the flexibility and the tool set, regardless of what the customer might have, normalizes things out, it gives them a better margin and cost optimization. Well, if model. I have a shared infrastructure where uh, I'm moving workloads from, let's say I'm doing a data center consolidation for multiple customers, I can have this as a multi-customer uh, multi platform and this, uh, whether it's V2V, P2V migration capability is just all part of my, now it's just part of my built-in cost versus That's a right. uh, project by so, project based cost. Absolutely correct. Right, you know, and, and now the, back to the slide, I promise you, I think that will help explain how a lot of this works, right? Customers have a variety of things today, different server platforms from a variety of vendors running a number of operating systems, you know, Linux, Unix, <coughs> Windows, hypervisors, applications, and all those need to go access storage on the back end, right? And there's all different kinds of storage, okay? We are talking primarily block-based storage here, okay? So think about it. I'm network attached storage, I might have flash, I might have disk, hybrid, it could be tape, you know, it could be physical, it could be virtually implemented. Ultimately, think of cloud as just another container. And what we come in and do is we create that intelligent abstraction layer, we virtualize that, create an aggregate pool, and that allows us to then apply those 15 years worth of data services that we have. And now you can begin to turn those on or off as you need to. Something that, again, we've improved over the, the legacy IP store platform that you mentioned earlier, you're familiar with, is we've added everything now, a fully REST API, right? So full REST APIs. So if I'm gonna go plug in and work with a service provider, they're obviously gonna have, the, most likely, their own console. We can now go and plug into that. If I'm an enterprise, right? I've got a fully HTML5 web-based interface. I've got my management database there. If they need the monitoring and reporting, there's something that they want to get access to that's not can report, they now have a full set of REST APIs that are publicly available, and they can go consume and report however they choose to. So let's take how this might work, right? So maybe I'm that service provider. If I want to go migrate that customer's data off a legacy platform into my hosted facility, or maybe even within my hosted facility off a legacy platform to now implement Flash, Right. I could go turn those services on. I don't have to stop, get a new license, turn the services on, form the migration in a policy-based, controlled way. I can make that happen. Now maybe they've moved that customer's data into their own premise and they're saying, hey, you know what? I want to implement a new you know, um, transaction. You talk about OLTOP. You know, I've got a new finance system I want to go put in. It needs to be on high performance, highly performance storage. It's got to be continuously available without adding any more hardware, without going and buying any more licenses or acquiring any more software, they can turn on, orchestrate, and deploy that capability for that customer. And the same thing happens if they want to do protection and recovery, they want to do snapshots. Right? We support over a thousand snapshots per instance. I mean, I don't know of any other vendor that's really getting to that d direction now. I mean, SVC, for example, from IBM is only around 250. We're at a thousand. So we can get extremely, extremely granular. So FreeStore becomes my data services provider. The, it consumes data from the underlying, I'm a semi-networking guy, so mm -hmm. I'll call it the underlay. So, so the uh, storage arrays underneath. So how do, I, how do I migrate from consuming data directly from my original storage arrays to now that being redirected to free store. That seems like a heck of a project. Yeah, um, so there's a little bit of a challenge to implement it. We've got a topology slide that we can, let's just go ahead and jump to that. <laughs> so with free store, we have a free store storage server. It sits in the data path, right? And from there, we are well positioned 
to now be able to orchestrate, provision, apply, and present the appropriate data services out to the client side, right? What we're doing is we're actually taking the underlying physical storage, we're virtualizing it, <coughs> right? For, for a LUN connection, right, we're providing the LUN connection. It's abstracted from the underlying physical. Mm -hmm. So that allows us to do things like four-way clustering. I can do active active four-way clusters. I can switch things over. This application has no idea because we've abstracted the address. They have no idea that the physical connection changed. They don't need to know the physical connection changed. We're managing all that for them because we have that abstraction layer that allows us to go do that. So now I could take, for example, with four-way clusters with the act that are active active, I could go take an existing legacy environment and now make that an active active environment, no new hardware required from so a storage infrastructure point of view. That's a powerful capability, but one of the things that kind of jumps to my head is how do I stop myself from getting in trouble? So, you know, okay, I, so just we're going like to talk about some of the analytics. Yeah. So, so I'm going to talk about some of the analytics and the trending and the reporting that we've got. Even, yeah, it's not even trending and reporting. It's just, you know, and people in v, VMware in general and administrators, every time we've talked about virtualizing storage, you know, I take, I can create this cool cluster, but what happens when I create a cluster from this separate components? Yeah. So, you know, I've now, I've, I'm running... NFS or iSCSI on my laptop, and I create a long, and then I have stuff running from, from a, this is a, a silly example, but it's, you know, possible, and storage from a VMAX, and now I created a virtualized storage pool. How do I stop crazy stuff like that from happening? Well, you know, that, we are not going to dictate what policies are going to happen within time of, in, inside of a data center, right? Obviously, the IT organization, the governance is going to have to come in and say, hey, look, we're going to set up a, a certain set of policies. I'm going to let you talk to the man here who's got a lot of experience with that, obviously, with eBay. I mean, yeah. How do so, real world? I've not been a real world IT yeah, guy. So, so how, let how a real do, world IT I guy answer this? that for you. How do I give my, because, you know, you have the architecture layer that says, okay, this is how it should work. And then you give this to engineering operations. How do you ensure and check? Because you can't stop somebody from making a mistake. But how do you find these mistakes and correct them? So a lot of times it comes to policies and how you implement the policies and how you hand things over and all that. But also as far as functionality, we have functionality built in, such as uh, continuous data protection, such as snapshotting. So in case there is a problem, in case there is something that happened, you can always roll back. And our, our snapshotting technology is actually application aware. So it's not just bits being snapshotted. It's actually application aware in, you know, in case of, for example, an, an Oracle database. You, know, you can actually bring the entire database back to an, an, an original So that, that's like, so, that's the <coughs> event recovery. I'm talking about policy auditing. So if I need to, I create, a, I create an offline policy that say right. thou should not do stupid stuff. I trust you, but I'm going to verify that okay. you haven't done so there's only so much software can do to prevent stupid human tricks, mm -hmm. right? We have, you know, for example, with RecoverTrack, our migration engine. So let's say you're doing a migration and the guy says he's going to go off a of VNX over to an iSCSI box. Hopefully they're capturing one of their SLAs, you know, or my IO requirements, my latency requirements, right? We can put that in. We give the, the ability to go non-disruptively test that. So I can tell you things like, oh, you know what? Gee, a driver's missing, an IP address is missing, uh, authentication credentials are missing. Um, oh, hey, guess what? You know what? When we do the I.O. test, it's not meeting your threshold. So we've got the ability to give you those kinds of alerts. We are implementing some new technology that we partnered with Cumulus Networks to get to go drive additional analytics that will take that even a step further. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. I, I don't know of any software that can ever eliminate stupid human tricks. No, I'm not but talking about the elimination. But what we can do is we can, give you, we can give you the ability to flag and alert things. We can allow you to go do non-disruptive tests mm -hmm. to make sure that you have done it correctly before you go put that in production and hopefully eliminate or at least minimize any kind of exposure that does happen. So let's <laughs> raise it up a level from detecting pr misconfigurations to enforcing policy, like real storage policies. You know, when we talk about software-defined storage, software-defined storage is defi software-defined because it's policy-driven. If you don't have a policy that drives right. software-defined, it's not software-defined. It's software-configurable, but it's not software-defined. 
So software defined storage policies. Talk about what policies I can create and enforce using FreeStore. There's a number of things that we can go do. We can talk about access, we can talk about performance, we can talk about recovery point granularity, we can uh, talk about recovery time granularity, we can talk about optimization and utilization of resources, we can talk about performance uh, you know, thresholds both in terms of I.O. as well as latency. So there's a number of parameters that we have that you can go in and you can figure and you can go set up. There are additional things that we've got to go continue to go work on and refine some of the things that improvements that we're making um, when we come out to early uh, next year. Uh, that's been direct feedback from some of our larger MSP customers around multi-tenancy and security enhancements. So there's a number of things. Our policy engine is set up to give you that kind of control and that granularity so that when I'm going to go set up a resource, right? So walk with me for a moment. I want to go say, hey, I've now I've now uh, virtualized everything here. It's in my pool. Mm -hmm. When I want to go now configure, provision, and apply the resources and the appropriate policies and now orchestrate that out to the OS or the application, we give you steps in each one of those layers on how to apply the appropriate policies. Right? Am I going to say, hey, we're the end all be all, we've got it all solved? No, I'm not. But I'm going to say, you know what? Today, I probably do that better than most across all of our capabilities. And, uh, and, and one more thing then, uh, as far as audit capabilities, we have actually developed a whole new GUI, which we will, we will actually demo here. And there is extensive audit uh, capabilities that are in there and will be built in there in, in order for you to actually go back and take a look at what's been happening and, uh, and be, uh, you know, be able to have complete visibility into what happened and why. Okay. One of the other things that we do that I think is also very, very unique, and it goes back to, remember that slide where I talked about the front end, the middleware, and the back end, mm -hmm. right? Because we sit in the middle, we sit in the data path, we are in the perfect place to go capture you know, the analytics around what's going on. So I can give you... Go back a second. So on your topology here, just talk us through this. Is the free sort of management server, is that a physical box, a virtual box? Does okay. it see some of the same stories that you're inspecting? That's so kind of like an exception. We have physical... Oh, great, great. We got sidetracked, so thank you for bringing us you know, back on and letting us finish this slide. So we take the physical network attached storage here, we virtualize it into a common pool using our, our free store storage server. That can be a virtual machine or a physical box. We don't care. Hold we'll on give a you second. The specs. You virtualize it, you take existing storage, and then you virtualize that into a pool. Does that mean that that storage can be used at the time? Does that mean that storage can actually have used blocks on it, or does it have That's to be right. We don't blocks? care. You can take all, you can take portions of an array, pull it in. You can take all of an array, pull it in. We don't care. We give you the ability to decide how you want to choose that. Right, so you don't need a clean pool of storage. You do not. Uh, brought Again, in. So something so that's not, unique oh, about what we do. Not really in the used. middle because you're not handling the queue depth, uh, etc. Uh, we, we are, and I'll, I'll explain as why here in just a second. Because what was happening is we are serving everything up, right? So we can look and examine what the queue blocks are. It gives us the ability to, when you talk about, you know, I.O., when you find your bottlenecks, and with our analytics tool, we can identify what those bottlenecks for are, right? Today, I can't solve a queue depth problem on a physical layer. Mm -hmm. But what I can is give you another means to go deal with it because I'm abstracted from it. So if I find I'm having a queue depth issue, well, what are my options? Move it to a different place that has better performing storage, right? Well, if I do that, do I have to stop, replicate everything over, reconnect, so, reprovision out? But it was what I can more do. questioning uh, the, uh, the design. So uh, my, my boxes, are they, uh, my ESX host, are they now seeing only the free store? Uh, right, when we sit in, because, you know, we would have vCenter integration, right? We, we, have, we <coughs> do have vCenter integration, so right, we are provisioning the storage up to VMware. ESX, yeah, okay. you know, application. So, so OS. my my old Phoenix is is gone as f from the perspective of the ESX Correct. I host. Yes, I only talk to the free store appliances. You, the application, the OS, is talking to us. We st we are the direct connection. We are providing you know the address, provisioning the storage with the appropriate data services. And it sees us. It does not see the physical storage underneath. And then you still say that um, a a, a, a LUN which became a data store on the VNX. Mm -hmm. In the migration phase, you just pick it up and present it again as the same data store to my ESX IOS. So what we're doing is you're, the data store is actually being provisioned from here. It's abstracted from the underlying. So it might have been on VNX. If we needed to move it over, 
right? No, no, or replicate it in the background, the application in the OS would have no idea that even happened. I think what okay. the question is, is I've got a EMC, HP, Net, doesn't matter what it is basically, that's presenting a data store currently mm -hmm. to an ASICSI host. Yes. It's, it's all happy. And then you're saying you can consume that. Yes. How is that then presented back to the A6I host? Okay, I, I, I see where I misunderstood the question. That's the question. Oh, okay. I don't get it. <laughs> I, I, no, I, I see exactly where I misunderstood the question. So what's going to happen today is we would migrate you from the physical into now what we call a, a free store storage server. So it's not in place. You move right. off. You move off your storage platform. You we would absorb it into in. your platform. Then you take that other storage. You virtualize that into into storage that can be used. And we do it, there's, initially there's, a, there's an initial cutover, right? Okay. You can't avoid that. Okay. Yeah. What is unique about yes. how we do it <laughs> is while it's on your physical storage, I can migrate it, replicate it in the background based on whatever policies and thresholds we've had. So it's non-disruptive. When it's ready, at your convenience, Mr. You know, IT organization, whatever maintenance window, great, cut it over. Obviously, in some cases, you're going to have to reboot a machine to get the address to change over. But, but could I also, for example, on the same uh, array, could I uh, have a few LUNs dedicated to my ESX yes. IOS? So I can, can do storage fee motions to, um, to avoid down downtime during sure. we have, In fact, we have a number of customers that may have, that have, there's a thing here I keep tripping on, that have existing storage that's been allocated and they've taken whatever is not used and now we will consume and that and, and move that in. And, and Correct. You need, you need a little bit of swing space to start yeah. off initially. Uh, uh, to, yeah. start, to start. <clears throat> but I mean, that makes sense. It's not, sure. not yeah. a problem yeah. with that as well. Correct. <laughs> when you then add your, so you have your swing space, you move it over to, uh, you have a small little LUN, let's call it 100 gig, you move your first VM over, mm -hmm. you then take that uh, LUN from the VNX uh, that it was on, take it out and then stick yeah. it onto FreeStore. How is that then uh, attached? Is FreeStore then seeing a single LUN on your VNX or multiple LUNs or how's it, how's it taking charge of that third party storage? So what happens is, depending on how you've got it, you want to configure it, right? We can look at it as a single pool and pull it in. If you've got multiple LUNs that have been mapped, we can map all of those in as well and deal with them individually. It really depends on how you've got it provisioned when you initially set it up. So I don't care. I can look at it one giant LUN or a whole bunch of individual LUNs, and I can manage each one of them independently or as an aggregate. That's so part of the beauty of the tool. In, in theory, I can take a VNX that was optimized to... Uh, serve a SQL database that did backups. I don't care what it was. And, and then I can take that, migrate the data off, destroy the VNX, create the, uh, recreate the lung pool to present the free store to be optimized for whatever, for whatever level of services I want to offer at the free store. Precisely, and that's part of the beauty of where, because we're abstracted, I could create different classes of storage, right? I could have a, a platinum, a gold, and a silver, and that might be based on performance, price, attributes or capabilities such as, you know, continuously available, snapshotted and recoverable, deduplicated. We give you the flexibility to now present that storage up the way you need to have it consumed as a set of resources and orchestrated at the storage infrastructure layer, not an array by array layer. So I don't know if we're going to get into like the the depths of the Thank performance, you. though, because the what happens is, you know, I from a from a array perspective, I can understand if I add if I have four storage processors and this much I can get this much throughput based on my disk layout. I have a whole new way of thinking now that mm -hmm. I have this free store layer. That's and right. How does this scale out? Does it scale out? Does it scale up? How does it scale? So we can get up to 128 of these nodes behind a single management server. So I give the ability, if you find out that, hey, you know what, you sit this in front of flash, all flash storage, and I'm starting to max out my I.O., great, add another node, scale out, right? Hey, if I want to scale up on capacity, great. Make sure I have a server, either physical or a VM box that has enough ports, and I can add more disk behind it. So I give you to be able to scale up or scale out. We can mix and match these as single nodes, dual node clusters, four node clusters, we don't care. Mix and match up to 128 behind a, a single management server. Again, the management server, it can be a physical appliance, it can be a VM, we don't care. A couple of questions for you. Um, the free store DG repository, Yes. Why is that separate to the storage servers? Okay, so with the dedupe repository, obviously we have to have you know, our hashing space and what have you. So we've got to set this up, right? Today, 
um, so that we've got that dedupe repository that we can keep track of everything. One of the things that we do is, again, we are deduping across the entire storage pool, not array by array. This helps us offload, do the dedupe, the compression here, right, so that you're not doing it down at the array level. And, and the storage servers are just handing off, right? They're not actually storing any, because that, the data actually yeah. We data. are We are managing and right, all the right, <laughs> and so all the allocations, all the reads, keeping track of it all, all the metadata. It's still, it's still sitting physically down here. We're managing it all up here, all the metadata and everything, that, and, and all the so, control points. We are the control <coughs> plane at that point. So you're also not, not caching in any way? Uh, we do cache. We do cache. And in fact, we've got things like hot zone and safe cache that allow us to go optimize so that if you have you know, spots where you need to do caching to improve performance, we can go do that. If we need to add additional cache to, as, for additional buffer space for, to handle the dedupe, we can do that. So you're doing the caching of a free store layer, uh, sorry, of a storage server layer, in a dedupe, um, lower on. Whereabouts are you doing the DG? Are you doing it in memory? Are you doing it on disk? Where is it actually happening? So, uh, this is Farid Yavari. So, uh, yes, so to, add, to answer your first question, why FDR, uh, dedupe repository, is, is separate? Uh, dedupe is very expensive when it comes to CPU. It takes a lot of CPU resources. If you want to combine these, th there is actually a requirement, one of our uh, RFEs, to actually have a combination. But then, you know, then, then the FSS box gets extremely big. You, know, you would have multiple cores, lots of uh, storage, and that becomes a cost prohibitive type of thing. If we, if we actually uh, uh, combine the two, you, know, you would have to provision a lot bigger uh, hardware or, or a VM for FSS. So we have an option to actually uh, have it run separately here. And then uh, to, to address your, your second point, you know, it, it runs separately in line and globally. So if you turn on FDR, basically the path you, turn, you, you take is through this path here. If you have it turned off, it's the other arrow over there. Okay, so, so that... So the dedupe repository isn't a separate storage pool that is the dedupe Correct. stuff no, or something. No, it's, it's just it's the processing app. power to Correct. dedupe what's on the original storage. Yes. If you then turn on dedupe, your read would go from the storage through the dedupe repository, through the Correct. storage server, up to your client, cached at just the storage server level, not necessarily at the, oh. at the FDR. Correct. Right. So there's obviously going to be a lot of latency reading it from the storage, but your cache solves that. Correct. It, uh, precisely. And the Between. other thing that we've done, right, we've, we've, we completely re-architected and, and redesigned um, the core engine here. So we're optimized for high performance environments like Flash. You know, on a single node, before dedupe's involved, obviously turned on, you know, we're talking over 550,000 IOPS per single node, you know, in somewhere in the neighborhood on an average of 130 to 150 uh, microseconds of latency. So, you know, from this point, we're not, you know, we're effectively, we're not really slowing things down much, right? So I'm not going to go and impede the performance of that all flash array. Some of the work that we did with Violin a couple of years ago helped us go figure out how to optimize that. Obviously, when you start to turn on services like dedupe, it's going to slow things down. But between the enhanced compute power here and the caching, we can overcome a lot of that latency. Right. So because with all flash, you're obviously you, you're buying an all flash array, particularly that you mentioned something like Violin, but 3D NAND and those kind of things. Sure. You are so... The, the performance of that flash is, is why you're spending that huge amount yes, of that flash. That's right. Coming through another system like, uh, like Freestore, mm -hmm. surely people are going to be worried about uh, not having that performance because your caching needs that's to right. be faster than your end. And, and that SSD is devices. part of where the beauty of Freestore comes in. If you pull in, say, that violin where you, you know, it is higher performance, or maybe it's one of the, the tier two guys where they don't allow you to turn that dedupe off. When you pull that, that LUN into the free store, right, we can turn off dedupe so that we're not doing it twice. We're not getting in the way. And you can actually take advantage of that lower hardware layer if you feel that that's going to be a better performance and a better asset for you to use. Or we can allow you to turn it on on the rest of the areas and now take advantage of things like global dedupe versus array by array dedupe. We've got that flexibility. Turn it on, turn it off as this requires, you know, by your environment. But to get your storage performance, your storage, the flash in your storage server needs to be as fast, if not faster, than the faster sure. flash in your server. And, and, and there's, there's, when there's places that we're going to be good enough, and there's places where we're not. Yes. Absolutely. But again, it's all about how we give you the flexibility to address that. We don't lock you in, but we don't lock you out. 
And that's sort of high availability. So your storage pool, you could have some EMC, some HP, for example, and you can, in fact, highly available across those two because it's abstractive. You know, okay, absolutely. I was at VMworld Barcelona, and we had Radio Television Switzerland up on stage with us. They have Hitachi, EMC, and IBM storage. And their first project they got was, hey, you know, they were given an edict to make some of their content continuously available. It was running on old VNXs. Well, you can't make VNX active active. They would have to go to VMAX plus VPlex to do that. Rip and replace scenario. We were able to come in, take their existing storage, add that capability to their existing environment. Then they said, great. They moved their, their, uh, all their production pieces to the VNX. They had a Hitachi box and an IBM box, and they wanted to make that into a cluster, and we were able to do that for them. Dissimilar storage, give them that capability. So real world environment of exactly where we did that. And I presume looking forward into the cloud, that storage, because you're caching it locally, that storage level could be Amazon S3, yes. for example. Ultimately, that's right. Yes. So just one thing while I'm getting the slides, your client is basically anything that can see an iSCSI LUN. So that uh, iSCSI a, or fiber channel, FCOE, okay. we don't care. So that would be an ESX host, could be a, could be a VM with SQL running with an in-guest iSCSI, yes. anything like that. That's correct. Okay. We could even have iSCSI here and present it fiber channel on the front side. Yeah, whichever, yeah. So your free software management you server, that. what happens if I lose that? What, what features do I lose in terms of... Say, I'm sorry, say again? If I lose the free store management server, what happens to me? Beautiful thing that happens. You lose your primary web-based interface. We still have a, a command line interface here. Because we're in the data path, not, all the, the storage servers continue to operate, the services continue to handle until you can get that box back up. So what happens then if I lose one of my storage servers? How do I get alerted about that without that box? Well, again, what's gonna happen is if you are running in a, you know, active, active cluster, the other side of the cluster is gonna take off, continually happen, your application's not gonna it. know, but we've got the ability, <laughs> SMS, text. That you know, wasn't my question, emails. my question was, how do I know about it if they freeze your management server? Because down? they're going to send you notifications via the storage server, not the management server. So what happens is the default is going to be from the management server. Right. If the management server is not present, this guy is going to let you know. Okay. And that you set that up when you set up your initial configuration. Okay. Thank and you. And the cluster is that? Does that have? If you've got an iSCSI connection, for example, is, is that a floating IP or do you do multi? Yes. It is a floating IP, right? And it, it's a requirement to do active active because if the data path changes, right, you don't have to have to see. You know, for example, in Hyper-V, that's one of the challenges of having an active-active cluster in Hyper-V. There's too much latency involved. So we give you that floating point so it's abstracted from the underlying hardware. You, the OS, the application doesn't even know that it's changed. So, uh, you know, I, I, I've always looked at your product as a product that I would, I would put in front of arrays that aren't already what I'll call value-added arrays, right? Mm -hmm. you know, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't put a, a VNX behind it or a... Or a uh, you know, whatever the other companies that we mentioned, uh, you know, I'd put like, because the thing is they all kind of come with their smarts. So you're either duplicating your smarts, running against their smarts, or, you know, at, you know, uh, and so I'm just wondering, you know, because people brought up some other brand name arrays and we talked about putting them, it's not that you can't, the question is why? Why would I do that? So let, let me take this one. Okay, so, uh, so the whole idea behind FreeStore is to enable you to run on commodity storage. So you're absolutely right. You know, the goal is to reduce your costs and run on commodity storage. We also support brand name storage because of all the migration and, and all the capabilities we want to provide to, with your existing infrastructure moving off into a, a hardware uh, agnostic type of uh, you know, a commodity environment at a very low cost. So, so it's, it's to every organization's benefit to actually run on storage that is not a brand name storage with, 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 without those capabilities that you right. just mentioned. So this but, isn't, but you haven't like changed the, product directions or anything like that? No, no, we haven't. But there's another way to, to take that a step further. You know, if, if a customer is running a nameplate storage, a name brand storage, and they're happy with it, great. You know, if it's not broken, don't fix it. You know, storage guy's motto, right? But when it comes time to renew, and they get that sticker shock, and it's hundreds to, th to millions of, hundreds of thousands to even millions of dollars sometimes to renew. I just gave them a really attractive alternative. I'm going to give you a scenario. You know, today, our list price 
right? Includes all the capabilities, 24 by 7 support, any new features we have, everything's included. There literally is no surprises. You only pay for the capacity you consume, right? I'm at $350 a terabyte list price. That's three cents a gig per month, okay, at list price. You want to go put in, you've got you know, a 500 terabyte VMAX, that's roughly half a million bucks. You add your VPlex software on top to give that active active capability. You know, that's another almost $100,000. Now I need Site Recovery Manager, now I get that they just you know, rechanged their licensing and all of that. The bottom line is that's somewhere in the neighborhood of you know, $600,000 and up. I'm a little over $100,000 for that same capability. And I don't require you to change your hardware. You can even now extend those capabilities across all of your hardware, not just on your VPlex. So I'm not going to necessarily displace a name brand storage up front. But over time, I think you know, IT guys are going to look at the capability of what we can do here and say, hey, wow, this is a much more cost effective way to do it. And it gives me much more control and much more flexibility. Well, the, in some use cases, you don't even have to displace the array. I mean, if it's nope. a DR use case, right. you want the CDP, what was CDP, you want continuous replication. Right. And you want a target, you can just take a bunch of disk separate storage, it doesn't have to do arrays mm. at your DR site, create a logical or virtualized array, and then you have your replication, you have your migration, you have all that flexibility. So the, the use case isn't just Right. Replacing or front ending existing arrays. Mm -hmm. It is to create, you can't create an array out of nothing. You can, can take, you can take, you know, commodity disk and you can create enterprise class capabilities with it. That's right. What I am not, and let's not confuse this, I am not taking and virtualizing the storage, the disk inside of a server. Okay? I am not a hyperconverged solution. What I am, I'm a step above that. We would consider, you know, a hyper-converged bucket, right? One of these other storage um, resources that we could then pull into our pool, right? Because when you're hyper-converged, again, it's another set of silos and another set of unique tools that are different from everything else I have. We also look at this as we're, think of us as we're the storage control plane. When you're hyper-converged, I'm no different, really. I'm just creating a virtual array. Make sense? So Tim, can I just um, ask you a general direction, directional question? Um, the industry is going away from centralized storage. It's going back to more of a fragmented model where people are putting in specific solutions for specific requirements. So That's right. people are putting in a lot of things like dedicated flash because they need the high performance, low latency and mm -hmm. so on. You seem to be going the opposite way and advocating carrying on centralizing everything. Uh, it seems to be a, at odds with the way that the industry is heading. Um, I, I, w I would challenge that for a second, and here's why. They are putting in specialized pieces. And every time I put in a specialized piece, I have to manage it separately with a different set of licenses and capabilities. And now if I have one for flash and one for high performance disk and one for maybe you know, lower or cool disk and then another one for cold storage, I've got all those different elements that I have to manage silo by silo. I have to license them. I have to get features, uh, hardware platform by hardware platform. That's true. If you want to go put in, no. all right, but, but follow me just for a second. Okay. If I want to go put in high performance storage, you know, based on a certain application or you know, solution requirement, you can do that. And what we're saying is we give the ability to now sit on top of that and now manage that much more effectively to use the resources more efficiently at a lower cost. That's what I'm saying. Okay, but to be fair, you know, if you look at some of the vendors, they're coming out with APIs themselves so that they don't need any management. You just plug them into a framework. If you're using something like OpenStack, you can plug in with Cinder. Um, there, are, there are lots of ways that the vendors are trying to eliminate those old legacy issues um, because they see that that's a problem for customers. Um, some of them aren't, you know, some of them don't care, but some of them mm -hmm. definitely are. And it just seems to me that that's the way that the, the industry is going, which seems to be sort of counter to the way that Yes. that you're sort of headed. So I guess the another, to, to Chris's question, it becomes a use case question. Is the addressable market people who have legacy storage arrays and they want to protect their investment and go forward with adding modern day capability? Or is it, you know what, this is our storage platform. 
And no matter what we buy, whether it's all flash array with the type of capability Chris just described, or if it's a hybrid array from 3PAR, you're just sourcing the most, the cheapest, most capable white box commodity hardware as possible. And FreeStore is our enterprise platform. Well, again, what is it the customer is trying to achieve and what benefits are they looking for? It could be that, you know what, we're helping them modernize in a more cost of less disruptive way. It could be we're able to get them from a legacy environment to a new environment. It could be I want to eliminate those silos and have a centralized common way of doing things. Maybe I'm a service provider that I need the ability to have common services to drive new revenue streams. So there are a number of things that we can go do. Rarely are we going to say we're going to do all those things for every single customer. No, that's not realistic. We're going to try to understand what it is that the customer needs. Our platform has the flexibility to help tailor it to what their requirements are. That's why we call it free store. It gives you the flexibility to turn and use only what you need. Right? If you don't need those other things, don't use them. Use them. You're not going to pay for them. So, uh, so you're saying that cost yeah. model is you can turn off those features at your array. You don't need replication. Don't need dedupe. Don't need right. all the bells and whistles that your array vendor is doing it. Pay free store to do it across multiple things. That's right. If you're happy with the solution that you have and either want to leave it in place, right, or make it part of your paradigm, but you don't want to, you want to continue to use those lower level tools, great. Don't turn them on for that particular LUN, right? Pass it through, be done with it. But I'm not going to charge you for it either, right? If I'm not managing that capacity and you're, you're connecting to it directly, you don't pay for it. If I manage that capacity for you and apply the data services, I'm going to charge you for the capacity that you're managing. Through you could look store. at it the other way though and say, yeah, you're paying for it regardless. You just might not be using it. So, you know, even if you don't right. use those features, you've still paid for them because you paid in a... Well, in, but it's so much the capacity. You don't pay for the capacity. Really? Yeah. Here's saying. the thing. Yeah. If I'm managing the capacity, I'm going to charge you for it. If I'm not managing the capacity for you, I'm not going to charge you for it. So if you've got that LUN that you've already got established to that application and you're not choosing to manage that through FreeStore, no, continue enough. to provision it out. That. I agree with that. But I mean, when you say turn on or turn off dedupe and you're not paying for that feature to turn it on. You've you're indirectly paying, paid for it because you've already sort of bought the product. In everything's the included. You're not paying for it uniquely. I'm not going to charge you one license for dedupe and a different not, one for CDP or another one for it's replication. It's not divided out. I agree with that. It's yeah. not divided out, but indirectly you are still paying for it because you're paying for the product in the first place. No, it's just like any other product. If, if Word, if I don't use, you know, track changes. I'm paying for track changes, even though I don't yeah, use absolutely. track changes. But, you know, ultimately, you are still paying for a feature. The difference is whether, you know, if it was itemized separately and you only used a tiny percentage of them, yeah, whether that would be a do, I, do I fly first class yeah. or do I uh, fly, fly speed? But, but, right, yeah, but, but if I'm also some of the other name brand vendors that charge you one for replication, another license for snapshots, another license for deduplication, Let's forget all that monkey business. I, 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 again, I agree with that, but the industry is heading to a, a situation where all of those vendors are now putting their license um, fees on a, a parity with what you're doing, where they're, you know, they're saying we're not going to do them separately. I, it's just, you know, maybe arrogantly, but certainly proudly, you know, hopefully we force some of that change because this is the type of change that's needed in our industry. The old ways of licensing are too restrictive. They're, it's not in the customer's best interest. We've got to find a way that you know, where we can all make money, right? We're not in to do this to be able to free, but we got to give the flexibility and the freedom back to the customers to consume as they need to based on what their business is, not by what I'm forcing them to do. Fair enough, but I think that argument will be less of a, a valid argument for you going forward because as, as vendors adopt your right. style of model. You're, you're right, you're absolutely right. Those won't be differentiators for you in the future, unfortunately. Sure, a absolutely. Just so, uh, double checking something you said about replacing SRM. Um, SRM doesn't do anything with storage, only give the signal uh, failover now. Uh, SRM, the main part is in bringing up the VMs, controlling how to bring up the VMs and the vCloud in a different uh, data center. Mm -hmm. So what is Freestore doing in that? So SRAM, did we? Did we mention you know, SRAM? I, I, I don't think we have mentioned it, and well, I would have okay, to say I'm not the right person to answer that question for you. Let's take that one down, and we'll make sure and get you an answer on that. Uh, I'm not I exactly thought you sure. mentioned uh, SRAM just a second, a uh, few. Uh, I'm pretty sure you mentioned SRM. and SRM, oh, not SRAM. So Site Recovery Manager, not SRAM. Oh, it's SRM. Yeah, Site Recovery yeah. Manager. So yeah. yes, I may have that's what I meant. So oh. just to be sure, do you do anything that replaces Site Recovery Manager from VM? 
Oh, I follow your question now. Um, well, I would say we can do SRM for everything outside of VMware, right? So could I technically replace VMware? Eh, I won't say I can completely do it. Sorry. But what I can do... Just to clarify this again, please, if I can, yeah? You're saying you can take a, a virtual machine, essentially, and you replicate for storage as per normal. But I can then take that virtual machine, basically, create a test network, a test bubble, bring that virtual machine up, and test it in a another location, basically non disruptively. Yes. Okay, I'm saying exactly but that, but and that is where our recover track engine comes to in okay. play because we can go do that, bring it up, because we integrate, we can go talk to VMware, provision the new VM, bring up the workload, make sure test it in a non disruptive, non production environment, make sure it's working correctly, and let you go and I'll report on it as well and yes. report. Yes. And then also in oh. a real DR situation, uh, you can do the same, but then in production. Yes, and I can do, here's the thing, I can do that for both physical and for virtual. I can do it for KVM, I can do it for Hyper-V, I can do it for VMware. It's something that's very unique about what our recover track engine is. done. We've had that capability since 2011. So again, I think one of the things that I like that I'm hearing is that if, the, if you were going out to go buy a rubric, uh, any other... <laughs> P to V, V to V, uh, V to P solution, whatever you are going to do to protect your primary data center for DR, you get this, and you can go out and buy this, and the to protect 300 and you know to protect you know eight terabytes of storage, you get that basic functionality and the other three pillars of capability if you ever choose to use it. Yes. So that's, the, that's one of the compelling selling points. Yes, we believe so. Can you clarify something for me? When you're talking about bringing up a virtual machine, you're actually talking about restoring one of your backups on the other site, correct? That, that is okay, correct. Okay, cool. Can you also then tell me how often you're taking those snapshots and replicating those snapshots? When, so part of the policy is that you have when you set up your policy of how frequently do I want to snap, right? It will allow you to set what that point is because we support up to a thousand snapshots. That RPO granularity can get very, very quick, very, very small, right? So it, it, it's really when you set up what's my snapshot policy is going to tell you how often you're taking those snaps, how often you need to take the snaps it is a, obviously data frequency change, data, how much of the data is changing, how often is it changing, what policy do you need to achieve as a company. So there's a lot of things that you've got to go put into there, right, that we can't define for you, but we allow you to define through our policy engine. And but you also do replication, right? Yes, we do. Okay, do you plug into the, do you plug into VMware SRM? Do you have plugins for that platform? So if I wanted to do very, very continuous data replication with that technology and recover in that in that manner. So would that, is that is that a possibility? You, so I have a vCenter plugin. I don't have an SRM plugin. Okay, right. So but when what? I've used this product in the past, when it was CDP, yeah. I just did CDP continuous data asynchronous replication. Right. Yeah. And then in an event of a DR DR test, I just right. broke replication, created a snapshot on the oh. other end. You never break replication. I never break replication, but I create a snapshot. I create a snapshot on the other end, and then I, it's all on my other array. You meant Correct. suspend replication. Suspend. Yeah. No, suspend. not even suspend replication, but <laughs> just create a, rep, a snapshot. So, yeah. so one of the things that we do now, because where you were able to do that in an asynchronous way, we also now are able to do that in a synchronous way. This is right? quite interesting. And one of the things that we do is we journal everything so that if there is a hiccup in between, we still have it captured. So, yeah, so this is quite interesting for me because we had a client recently um, who looked at NetApp, okay, to talk about another vendor for one moment, and their workflow automation engine. Mm -hmm. And they made a decision to go down the route of VMware Site Recovery Manager to have an industry standard yes. rather than going down the route of having proprietary software yes. to do that particular part of it because then they had all the support wrapped around it, basically their management and so on and so forth. And they would invest more money to have something which basically does the orchestration of it, which is non-proprietary, versus going on the route of using a proprietary bit of software for one storage vendor. Sure. Because they saw it as a massive risk, it and is. it was a quite a unique skill set as well, yep. um, which they were concerned about staff changes, and not, ha not being locked in, essentially, shall we say, to WFA. Yep. You know, 
You, every organization has to assess their risk and their risk tolerance, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to stand up and say, hey, I am an SRM replacement, use me instead of SRM. I am an SRM alternative, and oh, by the way, that mm -hmm. alternative happens to be at a significantly lower price point and has a hell of a lot more flexibility because you're not stuck to a single VMware platform. Mm -hmm. right? Right. And I can do it, by the way, outside of VMware. I can do it with different types of storage, different OSs. You know, so you're not locked in. I'm not going to say I'm a replacement. I'm going to say I'm an alternative. Is that a fair statement? So does your, does your VM restore process pre-provision to reduce the recovery time when you need it? You can absolutely set that up. And so one of the interesting things that, again, whether you're going to use us or you're going to plug, we're going to plug in, right? Because there's a couple of ways that you could go manage that. Um, if you're going to say use us we can have that copy over there so we can do that replication in advance we can make sure that it's synchronous so that if you have to do a recovery and a switch over it's already preceded your your reboot time is how quickly does it take to boot from that snapshot because it's already there yeah because i'm used to the concept of that kind of a restore pre-provisioning to a right. point and then when you flick the switch to say yes i need to recover it basically just finalizes the snapshots that it's missing to yes. get you from the last pre-provision yeah, to your point in time and, now and, and go ahead yeah yeah, this is, this is definitely application aware, a replication, and in, t in case of continuous data protection, mm -hmm. as we write, we replicate. So, so there, is, there is no lag there. So what, right. You what don't have to go recompile, aware? we just instantly mount Sorry? and boot. In what way are you application aware? So, uh, application aware, so for example, in, in, in case of Oracle, for example, we have an agent running on the Oracle servers. Right. And then if you have different tables, you have, you have your redo logs, archive logs, all that stuff, and, and you're taking different snapshots of it, we are actually consistently... Right. So you have a number of agents that run on the host to, right. to support some of the features that your product offers. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So I've just got two questions. One was, I think uh, those free store servers can also have storage themselves. So you don't have to use third party storage because you can buy storage from free store that includes the actual storage included with your software managing. So typically we are not, we're going to sell you the software. If you, you know, because odds are you're going to get a better, you know, price from your hardware vendor than we are because we're a software company, so not a hardware company. So I could buy an HP server but, with flash and hard drives and yes, then install free server on top of that. That okay. would be correct. Yes, and, and also we have some uh, predefined uh, commitments that we've done through reference architectures. So if you come to us and say, I need this much IOPS, this much performance, we can make recommendations that you need you know, this level of hardware or this much CPU. So it's a sort of HCL, but not, not right. from the hardware point of view, but from a performance point of view as well. And then following on from that, so you can either, you can bring your own hardware, purchase your own hardware, or use an existing third-party uh, SAN. Sure. What kind of analytics do you have in your software that if I need to then, for instance, w uh, my working set for my Oracle database may be... Great terrible. straight man. Wow, thank you. Absolutely. Because I, I, I want Freestore to tell me what future storage I need to buy right. for the performance that I'm currently using. Oh. Yes. Take it away. <laughs> Take it away, Fareed. Well, <laughs> but uh, maybe just one last question on the on the concept. So you could also replace, uh, for example, VPlex. We could absolutely. We could be an alternative to VPlex or SVC. Okay. That's, and we can do you know your four-way active-active clusters. Yeah. But I don't have to use a single vendor. I can come in and use existing storage and make it capable. Or you know I, you can put in a new implementation. So, so can you do stretched storage clusters across the We can, the absolutely. Up to what sort of... So typically, you know, between, you know, in a, in a, in a two-node configuration, um, you know, it's typically, you know, that kind of that 100 kilometers. Um, in a 2 plus 2, in a four-way, in a 2 plus 2 config, you could have your two local. They could even be, you know, two metro clusters in city A and another metro cluster in city B, and then using a, a connection between the two cities. So that can go e even further. But typically, in a okay, in so between so two nodes, a, a stretch cluster in one, a stretch cluster in another, and then replication yeah, correct between the two. And do so, you require a quorum or a witness basically to file over in a third site? How do you manage that? Yeah, um, uh, we, yeah, we, we do have a third party witness in that case, just to make sure that there isn't any issues, and that can be a VM, so it, you know, keep the cost down. So how do you provide quality of service then, or can you provide quality of service to a single VM inside of a data store? So quality of service is our roadmap item. We don't okay. currently have it right now, but it's something that we're going to be working on early part of 2016. 
and in fact, it's a shoot off of, of adding analytics. Um, last month, we announced, uh, you know, working with Cumulus to go add now um, analytics to our platform. So how do we get our platform to that next level? So as you were talking about, hey, you're running Oracle and you want, you know, a certain level of SLA to be defined. How do I know if I'm meeting that? If I'm a service provider, how do I know I'm meeting the SLAs of my individual tenants? How do we give you that capability? 